This episode is dedicated by Esprit Bochero to the cousin of his friend Gino Lonardelli, a now deceased Italian World War II veteran. More on that at the end of the episode. April 9th, 1943. You have a mighty army, and you have many allies who've been fighting what really is your war. But what happens when they suffer serious setbacks and lose big chunks of their forces? What happens if the war is no longer popular with their peoples, or if their soldiers begin giving up? Well, you better do something. You are Adolf Hitler. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Hitler approved the plans for the first gigantic missile silo to be built on the Channel Coast to one day rain rockets down on Britain. The British, well, the Allies, were on the offensive in Tunisia, attacking from the south and the west, and having some limited successes, but most importantly, the Axis forces were withdrawing ever further towards the north coast, where they might well be trapped. The British Eighth Army has taken a fair amount of prisoners, some of them Italians who've just given up, uninterested in further fighting. This week on the 7th, Hitler and Italian leader Benito Mussolini meet at Salzburg, mainly to revive Mussolini's and Italy's flagging morale. Hitler is actually meeting with the leaders of most of the European Axis nations in a row this spring. King Boris of Bulgaria, Mussolini, then Jan Antonescu of Romania, Miklos Horthy of Hungary. Thing is, their armies have all been hard hit in the fighting over the past few months. I mean, Romania lost two whole armies and Hungary and Italy won each. Antonescu's Romanian government has the army as its main pillar of support at home. So this is a big hit. The string of broken German promises of equipment and support. The disregard of warnings about Soviet offensive preparations. The unfriendly treatment of retreating Romanian units by German officers and soldiers. And the general German tendency to blame their own miscalculations and disasters on their allies all combined to produce a real crisis in German-Romanian relations. The stabilization of the southern section of the Eastern Front in March gave the Germans the opportunity to insist on Romania's falling back in line, but the fundamental basis of mutual confidence had disappeared. I'll talk more about this sort of stuff over the coming weeks. Mussolini wants Hitler to sue for a separate peace with the USSR so they can better protect Southern Europe. Of course, Hitler refuses. He also convinces Mussolini that they can and will hold out in North Africa, and Tunis will be the Verdun of the Mediterranean. But that is very much easier said than done. For on the 7th, near Gafsa, the Allied forces that invaded Africa from the west meet up with those that have advanced from the east. Also this week, 8th Army attacks the Axis positions at Wadi Akarit. The basic plan is for three divisions of 30th Corps, the 4th Indian, 50th and 51st, to lead the attack against the Axis center, held by the Italian Spezia and Trieste divisions, and then once the line is broken, 10th Corps will come through with hundreds of tanks. Some of 10th Corps armor will mount a feint in the hills to the west. 7th Armored Division is in reserve. This all begins at 5 a.m. on the 6th. Now, for most of a week before this happens, British and American artillery have been constantly pounding the enemy positions to soften them up. And now, from left to right, the Indian 4th, 50th, and 51st move in. The fighting is fierce, but after a few hours, the numbers begin to tell in favor of the attackers. Axis commander Giovanni Messe starts moving in the 164th Light Division to try to beef things up and also brings in the 15th Panzer Division in the afternoon when the Trieste Division starts to give. But I should point out that the Allies are attacking with an overall tank advantage here of 462 to 25. The 10th and 21st Panzer Divisions, who are facing the Americans, are also ordered to move towards the 8th Army attack. This should have been the cue for Patton to drive through and get up with 8th Army and take the whole of the Wadi Akarit battlefield area from the rear. But the Americans were apparently in no position to make such a bold move. Well, Ford writes that, but Rick Atkinson says not. He says, Army Group Commander Harold Alexander changes orders to the Americans to wait an attack on the 7th, but with no regard to any loss of armor. But by the end of the 6th, Messe knows he can't hold out for another day here. 
At 5 p.m., he reports the situation to Heeresgruppe Africa commander Hans-Jürgen von Arnim. Commando Supremo in Rome wants him to hold out, but Arnim tells them that it's hopeless and he is going to order the withdrawal to the Enfideville position. This is like 250 kilometers to the north. This he does at 8 p.m. with the mobile units first driving off and everyone else starts walking. 8th Army begins its pursuit at 10 a.m. the morning of the 7th, and the Americans begin their attacks to find not that much enemy left to fight. Sure, they finally take Hill 369 and the Macnassi Heights, but the bulk of the enemy army was only a dusty pal on the northeast horizon. In his diary, Patton wrote, Sic transit gloria mundi, thus passes the glory of the world. Allied planes savage the retreating columns, though, creating all kinds of havoc and inflicting big casualties on the Axis. Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, for example, 10th Panzer Division Operations Officer, who served in the USSR before arriving here in February, is so badly wounded he loses an eye, his right hand, and two fingers on his left. U.S. Second Corps and British Eighth Army troops spot each other in the distance and finally link up. You know, this could all really be another turning point in the fight for North Africa. Wadi Akarit has pretty strong natural defenses, but it could not, for even 24 hours, withstand the pressure of 8th Army. 7,000 Axis troops are captured, but a large number of those are Italians who gave up, again, because they just didn't see the point of fighting anymore. And now, finally one might say, Kenneth Anderson's British First Army brings in pressure from the West. See. With the withdrawal to Enfideville, U.S. Second Corps doesn't need to attack from Gafsa to the sea, so they're shifted to the north coast of Tunisia. The decision was not met with enthusiasm by the Americans. They felt that after much heavy fighting against crack German forces, they were being shunted to the north of Tunisia to make way for the all-conquering British Eighth Army. This is pretty much true. As we've seen, neither 8th Army Commander Bernard Montgomery nor Alexander think highly of the Americans at this point. But back to Anderson's 1st Army. Already on the 4th, 9th Corps is ordered to head to near Karawan so that 6th Armored Division can attack the Axis if and when they retreat to Enfideville, but they fail in this and Mess's troops are on the move and unmolested for the rest of the week. There is still fighting this week around Fonduk Pass, but I will talk about that next week. I have some fighting in the Soviet Union that I need to cover this week. Now, back on March 16th down in the Caucasus, Stavka ordered the North Caucasus Front and the Black Sea Group to break off their attacks on German 17th Army and go over to the defensive. Then they were to make preparations for another offensive to break the Axis lines. What they first did the second half of March was fix a bunch of logistical issues, partly by shuffling around forces. The Black Sea Group became part of the North Caucasus Front. Ivan Maslenikov would run the whole thing with Ivan Petrov as his deputy. The Soviet 18th Army under Konstantin Leselidze took charge of the troops at the Malaya Zemlya beachhead, which was two rifle divisions, two naval brigades, an artillery regiment, and parts of the 16th Rifle Corps. It was assumed that this would give him the power to expand and break out of the bridgehead. Maslenikov gave plans for his coming offensive to Stavka back on March 22nd. Joseph Stalin gave him the green light. The main attack would be by 56th Army at Krimskaya, with supporting attacks on 17th Army's left flank by 9th, 37th, and 58th Armies. The operation is to begin this week on the 4th. However, while he's been fixing things, the force that he's facing, well, it's not the force it was a few weeks ago. In February and March, Richard Ruoff's 17th Army did not get much in the way of replacements and took nearly 15,000 casualties. The vehicles and the heavy artillery are now in pretty bad shape and they're low on ammunition. And in spite of Erich von Manstein's big offensive further north taking Kharkov and coming to an end, troops are still being stripped from 17th Army for there and elsewhere. 52nd Army Corps has gone to Manstein. The Romanian Mountain Division is now in the Crimea. The 1st Gebirgs Division has been sent to Greece to do anti-partisan stuff, so Ruoff does not have the capability he did two months ago. His biggest concern, strategically, is that Malaya Zemlya beachhead, and he spent late March planning a counter-offensive to break that position 
which has some 20,000 Soviet troops in fortified positions. He does not have the artillery and armor left to break it on his own, though. So, the Luftwaffe say they'll send an air corps to help out. Now, north of the Kuban River on the 26th, the Soviets attacked the German 50th Infantry Division with pretty heavy force, but did so across open terrain that was waterlogged and German artillery drove them off. The same thing happened on the 29th, except there were Stukas now helping the defenders, which should have let the Soviets know that the Luftwaffe was coming back to the region. Another such attack came the 31st, again with heavy Soviet casualties. Meanwhile, the Soviets were attacking 17th Army's supply, especially by sea. They sank three MFPs, Germany's biggest landing craft, in March, out of a total of around 20 on the Kerch to Anapa route, so that's a big deal. What's also a big deal is the arrival of Luftflotte 4, with well over 500 combat planes as March ends. Soviet intelligence does not know this. Well, the battle for Krimskaya begins now on the 4th. The Axis have swamps and rivers on their left, and mountains, and Novorossiysk on their right, so the only real place to fully assault them is in the center near Krimskaya, where Gruppe Angelis holds the ground blocking the corridor between the river and the mountains to the south. By now, Krimskaya is defended in 360 degrees, with underground shelters to protect against artillery, and mortars and machine guns dug in and providing overlapping fields of fire. There are also landmines and barbed wire for any attacker to overcome. Andrei Grechko's 56th Army begins the attacks at 8.15 a.m. after a one-hour artillery barrage. Soviet units advance across hundreds of meters of open ground, and while many waves of them are just mown down, they do gain a fair amount of ground and nearly break through. But afternoon rain showers that sabotage both movement and visibility allow the Axis to push back to their original lines. 37th Army's support attack to the north also fails. This failure surprises Maslenikov to the point that he makes no attacks on the 5th, which allows another German Kampfgruppe to enter the scene. Soviet attacks the 6th also fail, and Maslenikov halts the whole offensive for a week to reorganize. There is an Axis offensive that begins this week in the air on the other side of the world. On the 3rd, Isoroku Yamamoto flies to Rabaul to supervise Operation I Go, which is to launch the 4th, which is his 59th birthday. The weather is bad though, and the planes are grounded until the 7th, when the huge Japanese aerial offensive begins. So many planes are taken from the Japanese fleet, actually, that it leaves the Navy with almost no trained pilots. 67 Val dive bombers, escorted by 110 Zeros, fly this day. They're met by 76 Allied planes. The Japanese planes arrive in waves, two higher waves, and then four waves of dive bombers against Guadalcanal. That's roughly the same total amount of planes as were in the first wave at Pearl Harbor. They sink a destroyer, a tanker, and a corvette. The attack costs the attackers 21 planes. The Allies lose seven. The Allies have also managed to evacuate their bombers from Henderson Field, so those all escape damage. Yamamoto, however, believes the exaggerated reports from his pilots of the sinking of many more enemy warships, so he will continue the offensive next week, sure of success. And here are some notes to end this week. On the third is the Battle of Manor Street. This is not so much a battle of the war, as a brawl between allies outside the services club in Wellington, New Zealand. Some American soldiers object to Maori soldiers being allowed in the club, and this escalates into a huge fight involving well over a thousand military personnel and civilians. Many dozens of people are injured, though as far as I can tell, no one is actually killed. On the 4th, 10 American POWs and two Filipino convicts break out of the Davao Penal Colony in Mindanao. It is they who break the news of the Bataan death march and some other Japanese atrocities to the world. On the 5th is a daylight allied bombing raid on Antwerp to destroy the Minerva airplane factory, arranged thanks to plans smuggled into London. But because of a navigational error, most of the planes drop their bombs in a packed residential area, killing 936 people, including 209 children at school. And on the 8th, Masakazu Kawabi replaces Shojido Iida in Burma Command to now be organized as Burma Area Army. 
They plan to extend their hold on Burma by building many new railway lines. 60,000 allied POWs are to be employed doing this. And that concludes the week. A week of a Japanese aerial offensive beginning, a Soviet ground one beginning, and allied Tunisian ones continuing against an enemy whose morale is failing. It's hard to blame them that much. I mean, the Italian soldiers are not fighting for the Nazi future. They were fighting to preserve and extend the fascist Mediterranean Empire, but that is long gone. They've lost nearly all of it, and everyone but Adolf Hitler can see that they are going to lose this last little bit. The question is really just when. So why are they fighting? They obviously know that the Allies will invade Italy, and then they'll put in some other sort of new government to replace Mussolini. But at this point, does the average Italian soldier in Tunisia really want to give his life to prevent that? It wasn't about ideology, it was about empire. And we saw the other week that Mussolini could not make striking workers go back to work. He did not have the authority anymore. It is possible that Hitler might soon lose his oldest European ally. As I said at the very beginning, this episode is supported by Esprit Bochero and dedicated to the cousin of his friend Gino Lonardelli. Gino was in the Ravenna division of the Italian army and fought on the Eastern Front. And when Operation Little Saturn was savaging the Italian Alpine Corps in January 1943, was at his divisional headquarters awaiting word of his cousin with the Corps. He asked higher officers why the Corps was not retreating with them and got this bluntly honest reply from one. To retrieve those men, we were formally obliged to give the order unanimously, and we all agreed except for one single officer, who subsequently condemned all of them to death. Gino wondered all his life who that officer was and got his answer shortly before dying in 2008, when a book was published with the finally declassified Italian archives captured by the Soviets. As the Hungarians collapsed, the retreat was not called. Not January 13th, 14th, 15th, or 16th, the day they lost contact with the Hungarians. A single officer, Italo Gariboldi, head officer of the Armir, against the advice of all of his colleagues, ordered reaffirming the absolute prohibition to abandon the Don River. A retreat was finally allowed the 17th, but it was too late. Alpine Corps was destroyed, as we saw. Gino went over the details with Esprit Bochero, who dedicates this episode to Gino's cousin and wants me to tell you all that it was Italo Gariboldi that gave the order to remain, which for most of the Italians there turned out to be a death sentence. If you would like to sponsor and memorialize an episode, you can find out how at patreon.com. See you next time.